Well, let's see what the Holy Spirit in the what the difference the Holy Spirit makes in our life and building upon a foundation. Turn to Romans 8, and we're going to be looking at Romans 8, 5 through 11. Uh, e. Stanley Jones, who was a missionary to India, he authored 29 books, including his bestseller devotional called The Abundant Living. His name was E. Stanley Jones, an incredible writer and a, and a deep thinker. And he preached to enormous crowds in India. In one of the services, uh, a woman came up to him and shook his hand and looked him in the eye and says, you know, <laughs> and this is great, you know, people come up after the service and tell you all kinds of things. But this person came up and said, you know, apart from the Holy Spirit, you'd be just a mess. And, and it kind of shocked him. People say, oh, good sermon, pastor. But he said, apart from the Holy Spirit, you'd be a mess. And he got offended, and he went home later that day, and he wrote in his journal, and this is what he wrote. He said, she was right, I am a mess. But with the Holy Spirit, I'm not a mess, but a message. I am an ordinary man doing extraordinary things because of the Holy Spirit who lives inside me. This is not boasting, it is a witness to God's mighty power. To say th anything else would be false humility and that would conceal pride. You know, we're all pretty ordinary in this room, aren't we? You know, we're just pretty much ordinary people. But we can do extraordinary things as God builds up his faith and through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The difference is are you being led by the Spirit in your life? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to make that difference in your life? Well, Romans 8, 5 through 11 really talks about that. In fact, it mentions the Holy Spirit nine times in just those few verses. And then it presents a series of contrasts between the non-believer and the believer and the difference that the Holy Spirit will make. The first thing I want us to look at is that how the Holy Spirit, uh, the differences that take place in our own mind. And in Romans 8, 5, it starts out, those who live according to their sinful nature. And it's talking about those and non-Christians who live in a sinful nature. The sinful nature really means flesh. And if you even look at the Greek understanding of the word flesh, and discover, you can discover that it really talks about self. People who pursue their own interests and forget about the Lord are living in the flesh. We'll talk today about carnal Christianity. Well, what is a carnal Christian? A carnal Christian is someone who, in a sense, lives in their own interests and really forgets about living for the Lord. So they're living in their flesh. They're living... Uh, in, in their own interests. I'll never forget when I was a young guy and saved at the Baptist church, and, and I remember this old-time guy coming up to me, and he goes, hey, how's your buddy, buddy Bernie? I haven't seen Bernie for a while. And I looked to him, and I said, well, I, I, don't, I, I think he's okay. You know, he's working and stuff like that. And he goes, man, I think that brother's worn out three pairs of, of tennis shoes backsliding, you know, and uh I said, what do you, you know, and what he was talking about is that he was being, he was living a carnal, you know, he wasn't around, he wasn't, you know, he, he was saved, he was doing all the right things, but he wasn't pursuing God. And this was at a Baptist church back in the 70s. And he, this older guy noticed that, man, if you're not living for God and pursuing the things of God, then you're just backsliding and wearing out your shoes. Pretty good word, isn't it? Pride. Okay. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 18. We're going to look at a large portion of Scripture that talks about carnal and what that really means. Uh, and that's not carnal candy. It's carnal Christianity. So 1 Corinthians, if you turn to that uh, 3, verses 1 through 18, we're going to read it together. And it's a lot of Scripture here. It says, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual but as worldly. Now some, that would be trans Lord, uh, translated into fleshly or carnal, okay? So when it talks about worldly, it's really talking about being carnal. And he goes, you're mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. 
indeed, you are still not ready. Now here Paul is letting a hammer down on the church. And, and if you realize that this is kind of a new church, it hasn't been around for a while, you know, it's kind of like the start of the churches. And already in the churches, there are all kinds of issues and problems going. You know, there is no perfect church. If you think you're a perfect, if there's a perfect church and you come to it, well, it's not perfect anymore because you just arrived. She won that one for a little bit. <laughs> but he says here, you're still worldly. Or you're still carnal. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul and I follow Apollos, um, are, are you not mere men? What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each of his tasks. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God makes things grow. I just want to stop here for a second. We bring in people into the church, and me as a pastor, I'll teach, and there'll be a Sunday school class, and we'll have different teachers and other people who, who teach us. And sometimes we put people up on such a pedestal because we think, man, that person is really gifted, or that person really knows the Bible, or that person, whatever it is, we put them on a pedestal, and we think they're way up here. And the reality of it <clears throat> is that it's God and his Holy Spirit that's making you grow. And he's just using that person as a mouthpiece. In fact, in the Old Testament, he spoke through a donkey, didn't he? So whose donkey are you? Who are you speaking to and allowing God to speak to you and through you? Just, just a little side note there. And so sometimes if we put all our eggs in the basket, when I was a youth, there was this speaker. And man, this guy was an incredible communicator. And hundreds and hundreds of kids accepted the Lord, high school kids. And I put this guy, I mean, I, this guy was my hero. He was a weightlifter. He was tan. He was looking good. And he was like, to me, you know, I think he was 45 years old at that time. And I thought that was ancient, you know, I was just a high schooler. And, uh, you know, and I just put this guy that he was all to all. Well, he ended running away, divorcing his wife and running away with one of the young girls that came to the camp. And, and um, I, I was completely devastated. Because I put this guy as such a man of God. I followed everything. I, I loved his teaching. I listened to it all the time. And I put, I put kind of all my eggs in, in the basket uh, in man. Instead of just saying that, hey, all of us fall short of the glory of God. And, and what I have to do is respect the word. And, and, and there's a thing of honor. We honor the offices that God has. But realize that they're all filtered through an imperfect being. You know, and uh, if you want to know if I'm perfect or not, ask my wife, you know, and she'll let you know how imperfect I am. You know, it, it, it's understanding that there is, you know, our heroes need to be God that we put as prime hero. And we have others that, that help us along the way. But don't put all your things in man because man ultimately will let you down. Amen. And here it's just saying that it's, it's not he who plants or he who waters, even he who sows, but only God that makes sin grows. And then verse 8, the man who plants and the man who water has one purpose. And each will be rewarded <coughs> according to his own labor. Now, I, I, I'm not going to preach on this, but you see the word reward? You know that the things that you do for the kingdom, you'll be rewarded for? Now, I, I'm not preaching on that this morning, but realize that God recognizes it and that there, no one else may recognize it, but there's a reward for that. Things you do, the Bible says, in secret, God keeps and has a memory for that, and he will bless you. Your sins are forgiven. The things you do for the kingdom, you'll be rewarded and remembered for. Isn't that awesome? Verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers, and, and you are God's field, God's building. 
by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an excerpt builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. Pause. I realized that coming to this church that there was many pastors before me and many congregations who led things and did things. They built upon in Elmira for hundreds of years. In this city, there's hundreds and hundreds of Christians who now they're with the Lord who laid a foundation in which we're building on today. And I'm thankful for foundations that were laid here in Elmira. You know that if you're <clears throat> most likely... As you come to the Lord, someone laid a foundation for you and a platform for you to be able to come into that thing. Someone probably laid down prayers for you they're not even aware of to be able to bring you into a kingdom. There's already been a foundation laid in your life that you're going to build upon. And you notice here that a building, a foundation is laid, and then what has to happen? A building has to be built. Are you building a kingdom of God in your life? It says here, but each one should be careful how he builds. How are you building your life in God? Verse 11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that's already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, or costly stones, wood, or hay, or straw, for his work will be shown for what it is, because a day will bring to light <clears throat> and will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as escaping through the flames. So verse 16, <clears throat> don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that the God's spirit lives in you? And this is just a key. If you're building upon a foundation in verse 15, that there's going to be a test of everything you're doing. And all the stuff that was for non-eternal use will be burned up. Are you building your lives in eternity that God will be able to say, man, this is pure gold in my eyes because he's built that for eternal purposes. And God says, and I will reward you for those things. <clears throat> and that you are a temple where God's spirit lives in you. If anyone uh, destroys God's temple, he will just, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Can you just turn to someone and say, you are that temple? You are that temple where the Holy Spirit resides. Don't deceive yourselves, from verse 18 says, if any one of you thinks that he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. I, I always like that because I can be a fool really easily. <laughs> you know, I'm not very wise. I'm not very smart. But you know what? I just place myself in a thing saying, God, I, I, I'm just available. Use this fool. You know, I'm just going to be a fool for you. You know, and so, what do you mean, amen? <laughs> so Christians, can Christians commit sins of the flesh? You betcha. And uh, it just, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4, it talks about that. But Christians won't live this way uh, and live in the habit of sin. We're going to trip up and fall, but it's not a habit that we live in that. We, f we fall at times into carnality, but we don't practice it. We set our sights on living a holy life and a life that's pleasing to the Lord. We don't set our sights in being pleasing to the world. We set a different standard for ourselves, a different plumb line. You know what? I can only lead you to the water, but I can't make you drink. I can only ask you and pursue and do all I can to, to say that uh, this is what God wants you to do. But you as an individual have to make a commitment in your own life, in your own walk to say that I'm going to walk in a way worthy of the gospel.
You have to make that decision to live that way. And everything we're doing in the church with our small groups and our special meetings, all these kind of things are to help you walk in a way that's, that's worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 John 3, uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, No one who is born of God practices sin. And then this is how, in verse 10, it says in 1 John uh, three ten, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. And I talked about love all the last time. You know, check yourself, examine yourself. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to kind of poke on your heart a little bit and say, hey, you know, where are you at with that? Non-Christians don't possess God's Holy Spirit. Non-Christians can't ask the Holy Spirit to point out things in their life, communicate, them, ask them to guide and direct them because there's no Holy Spirit in them if they haven't asked Jesus Christ into their lives. Romans 8, 5 goes on and says that, that they, their minds are set on what, their, what nature uh, desires. Another version says their thoughts are shaped by a lower nature, by a different way than us as Christians. Our minds or become then a thermometer, if you will, that indicates whether our, our, our hearts are healthy or sick, if our, if our souls are, are healthy or sick. In a sense, our minds can become something that we can use to judge our character. Look at what fills your mind. Use as a thermometer or, or put it on a scale of weight. What are you filling your life with? Are you filling with your things of God or are you filling things of this world? You know, if, if you were, you know, if we put the things that you do in your life on this balance beam, which way would the teeter totter totter to? <laughs> I just made that up. It's not my notes. But the believer's mind is different than a, than a, a, a non believer. In, in verse 5, it says, But those who live according with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. You know, there's traits, and I want to go over some traits of evidence of that in our lives, if our minds are set on what the Spirit desires. Here's a checklist, and as I kind of read through them, you can just check in your own mind if you're involved with that. Here they are. Here's, here's, here's some traits. We make it our goal to become holy like the Holy Spirit. We respect God in our lives. We delight in salvation. We pray to our Heavenly Father regularly. We hunger for the Bible. We thirst for worship. When trials come, we ask, what is God saying to me through this trial? How is he using this trial and tribulation to mature me and grow me up instead of just the blame game and everything else? We look forward to the return of Christ. Christ says, I'm going to come back for his church and that we're his bride and that he's getting us ready for that time. Are we, in a sense, live our life in a way that we're going to be ready for him to use? You know, the Bible talks about the 10 virgins who went out and five of them didn't have enough oil, so they, they had to go back. And while they went back, the groom came and picked up the brides that were ready and the others were left behind. How about you? Are you ready or would you be left behind? We also activate the gifts God has given us to reach the lost. We birth new children into the kingdom and we parent them in the things of the kingdom of God. How many of those in your own mind could you check off and say, yeah, that, that, that's me, I, I, I do have that mindset. I would say to you, if you don't, then you're probably at best a carnal Christian. If you absolutely don't do any of those things, I would even question, are you really a Christian or are you just going through the motions? And you might say, well, pastor, that's not fair. I once, <clears throat> story, uh, was out in Redwood City where I grew up in the 49ers practice there. And Joe Montana came out to the parking lot. I said, hey, Joe, how you doing? You know, and kept on walking, old skinny legs himself. Well, then I'd tell everybody, hey, I've met, I know Joe Montana. 
I didn't know Joe Montana. Joe Montana didn't know me. I just brushed up against him in a parking lot. Some of you, that's the same relationship you have with God. You see, you come to church and you, you brush up against them, but you really don't know. You don't have a relationship with them. And so that's something that you have to really deal with. Have you really had a transformation of your own life and that you pursue the things of God? There was a young gal who gave her testimony and of her faith in Christ and Someone heard it, commented, and made a statement. Well, you Christians are just all brainwashed. And uh, the woman heard it, this young gal heard it, and she said, you're right, I'm brain brainwashed. We're all brainwashed to a degree. The important thing is that we Christians get to choose what we wash our brains with. Are you allowing society to wash your brains and, and, and believing certain things? being manipulated in certain ways, and you're just so gullible. You know, any old dead fish can go down the stream, but it takes a strong fish to go against the current. And us as Christians, we need to be cross-current Christians, fighting against the current, being strong in the Lord. If not, we'll just go down the river like every other dead fish that there is. Only believers in Christ get to wash their brains with the Holy Spirit. Non-believers can't do that. In Romans 8, 6, it says, the mind, is, is sin, is sinful, the mind of a sinful man is death. William Barclay says this about that verse. To allow the things of this world completely to dominate our life is spiritual suicide. Death, and this death is a separation from God. It's a person who thinks of only their sinful nature, that lower nature, and how to gratify it. And they don't look at the things of the Lord in their lives. In contrast to this, in, in, it continues, it says in verse 6, the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Is life and peace. In the midst of the troubles that we face, there's still such a deep peace because the Spirit of life is within us. I remember going, when I was in college, I had to suffer for Jesus, and I had to go to Hawaii for three weeks. It was tough, but someone had to do it. I'll go, and I got college credit for it, too. It was awesome. And, um, and when we were there, we were doing teacher's conference and teaching uh, for Christian education kind of stuff. And I, we went out uh, at night uh, and went out during the day, and I tell you what, the hookers were as thick as the, the fleas. I mean, we had, and I've never, I mean, we had people asking us for a date, and I thought I was kind of special. And then the guy pulled me aside, they're hookers. Oh, <laughs> whoops. They were everywhere. I mean, they were just everywhere. And they, and they would say, hey, do you want to have a good time? And uh, would you like to party? And they're saying these statements that I, I wasn't quite catching. You know, yeah, I want to have a good time. I didn't realize that what they were saying, you know. And, and hey, we can, you know. I, I mean, I just was, you know, we were there doing church stuff. I was kind of a missionary, you know, and not realizing what they were asking me. And, uh, and when, then I found out, well, wow. And then as we went to church that night, and we sat in the service, and it was such a peace and such a joy and such a good time in the Lord that we were having. And I thought that, man, if I could just put that in a pill and sell it, I'd be a millionaire because that's what the world is after. They want to have it. They want peace. They want joy. They want happiness. Can I, they come up, can I make you happy? I said, no, I'm already happy. You know, I didn't understand what they were saying, but it's the devil's lie. Because after that little bit of happiness would bring so much misery in my life, it wouldn't be worth it. But we give into the light. Why? It's because it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can truly find happiness and joy. It doesn't mean easy road. It just means that in the, in the midst of it, the Holy Spirit comes in and does such a deep work that sometimes the outside circumstances, you know, don't matter as much anymore because of what God has done to the inner person. And then it goes into the next portion of Scripture. Oh, okay, here's... here's um. 
here's the things that the peace that God has given to us. In Ephesians, it says he has forgiven our sins. In Jeremiah, it says that he has a good plan for our lives. In Romans, he says he's working out everything together for our good. Another scripture in Romans says, we'll let nothing separate us from his love. We learn to move in his supernatural giftings, and all of a sudden, he uses us in a way that we kind of look at ourselves and say, did I just say that? Did I just do that? Did that just happen through me? And those are great. All of a sudden, we realize that we're being empowered by something that is supernatural. God in his spirit is supernatural. And we get so free. You know, we, it, you know, we'll go to palm readers. We'll see, you know, all the ghost things on television. And then when we talk about church, something supernatural, we say, oh, you know, get away from that church. They believe in the gifts, you know. Now, what's wrong with this world? <laughs> T.J. Bach wrote this. He says, through the Holy Spirit, you may have strength for every duty wisdom for every problem, comfort in every sorrow, and joy in his overflowing service. That's the kind of difference that God and his Holy Spirit can make in our minds and work in our lives. And then uh, the Holy Spirit makes a difference in our heart. We find four descriptions here of the non-believers, and there's a study here in a contrast. And sometimes as you study the Bible, you got to look at contrasts and similarities and try to look more in the depth of what it's trying to say. In Romans 7, it says, the sinful man is hostile towards God. That's one of the descriptions for a non-believer. He's hostile towards God. This means that the sinful mind is, it doesn't say that the sinful mind is indifferent or that it feels for nothing, but it says it's hostile. Hostile. When you hear people use God's name and the curse, you know, it shows hostility. When they scoff at God's word in you and they mock you, that's hostility. They ridicule his work in the church and so easily they want to pick out all the faults that the church is doing. They resist his spirit because they're hostile. They despise his worship and they reject his son. And then as you live for him and you reflect the son of God in your life, they'll reject you also. Some it'll be a drawing. And some, it'll be something that they want any part of it because you're reflecting something that's holy. The Holy Spirit is indwelling within you. And, and the more you let the Holy Spirit out, either people will repent and they want to know what, what to do about their lives because of your presence and the Holy Spirit in you, or they'll reject it. That's because the world is hostile. I remember once when Howard was coming back from the mission field. Man, he was so on fire for God, and he was wearing Christian T-shirts at his work. He was sent to the office, and he's one of the upper management people. Can't wear those shirts here anymore. They talk about God, and we don't want to be offensive. You know, when we start living for the Lord, there will be rejection because the world is, world is hostile. <coughs> The second that we see here in, in verse 7 is that the sinful mind does not submit to God's law. Submit in the translation is that, is that it means that you actually are under orders. Submission is when you come under orders. If the God is a rightful king of kings of your life, then you submit to his laws, you submit to his way. And people who don't want to take orders from God, they have an independent or rebellious mind. They refuse to obey God's law. When God's word says to do something, they'll just say, well, that, that, that might be for someone else that's old fashioned, but you know, God can't really mean that for me. All of a sudden they turn things around and they won't submit their wills to it. And then it continues on and it says in verse seven, nor can it do so. Here's a description that is pretty descriptive of the non-believer's heart, and I hope you can catch this here. It it's kind of says, see, the previous verse tells us why we can, and verse 6 says, the mind of the sinful man is death, which means there's no power, there's no authority. The lost sinners are like bankrupt uh, de debtors who are unable to pay a, a debt that they owe. They still owe it, but, it, but they're unable to pay it. That's why non-believers can't use their spiritual because uh, there is no spiritual thing in them. 
They're spiritually bankrupt because they haven't been able to go before the God and accept the Holy Spirit in their lives. Their, their inability comes before God in the time of judgment. It's no excuse because God says, I paid the debt for you, but you wouldn't receive it. You see, non-believers have a debt to pay that God set out, but unless they accept Jesus into their lives, then there's no way that they can even understand that they haven't been able to pay that debt and they can't pay it because they owe it. It was only the blood of Christ and through Christ that it could be received. James Montgomery uh, wrote an illustration about the non-believers' inability to obey God. He said this, the animal world, there are animals which eat nothing but meat. They're carn, 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 help me out. Thank you. And uh, there are other animals which eat nothing but grass or plants, and they're herbal. Yeah. Imagine then, I had this word earlier, I have it highlighted, but I just, my tongue isn't working. But he goes, imagine then that, that we have a lion who is a carnivore, and they place a beautiful bundle of hay and oats before them. He will not eat those things. Why not? It's because he is, because it, uh, is he physically unable to? No. Physically, he could easily begin to, to eat that food and swallow it. But he doesn't eat it. It's not his nature to do so. Moreover, it's, it's, it, it's, um, it, if it was possible for the lion, why wouldn't he eat the herbal herbivore, yeah, meal, he would say that um, I can't eat this food because I just can't stand it. I hate it. I hate it. I will eat nothing but meat. We're speaking similar ways for a natural man cannot respond or choose God because physically they're able to, but spiritually he's not. Spiritually they can't receive it. And that's why the Bible says a lot of times the things of God are foolishness to the world. If they don't have the Holy Spirit in their lives, there's no way that they can understand things of the Spirit. The fourth piece of evidence <clears throat> that the non-believer has a corrupt heart is in Romans 8.8. 8. It says, those who are controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Why not? In Hebrews 11.6, it answers the why not. It provides the answer for us. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Non-Christians can please other people and themselves, but they can't please God. They may try to do things to gain fa favor, but they just cannot please God. God accepts people only in Christ. That's why in John 14, 6, it says, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's how we gain acceptance, through the blood of Christ and what he did on the cross. That's when we can come into the fathers. You see, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, there was no way that they could please God. They wouldn't even mention his name. They, there was no way that, that they'd even get personal with God because there was this wall. In fact, it was a priest, wasn't it, who had to go in the Holy of Holies, and they were only entered into that back room. There was, there was only special privileges. But in the New Covenant, all that was, when Christ did on the cross, that was wiped away, and we all now, can go and have, not only do we have a relationship with God, but he's adopted us as his son and his daughter. In verse 9, it says, you, however, in contrast now to the lost person, the unsaved person, you, however, are, con are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. And if the spirit of God lives in you, does the Holy Spirit guide and direct you? Do you allow the Holy Spirit to control your life? You know, once we felt resistance to that, once there was hostility in our own heart, we used to be of that which the Bible talked about. We were rebels against the law, but now we submit under to the God. We submit ourselves to that. We now enjoy uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. You know, as a pastor, there's no greater joy in my life to be able to kind of see in people's life the change that takes place, to be amazed to see someone who is running away from God now running to him, 
to see someone who was bitter to the Lord, now they're in love with God. To see someone who resented the Lord, now is thankful for them in his life. Only the Holy Spirit can make that difference in the human life. But it's a joy and it's a privilege being able to see that in individual lives. You know, you yourself, I, I know that when I started in high school and I became a Christian and, you know, they just, they first just right away started to teach you how to win others to Christ. And then there's no other joy and no other greater fulfillment in a, in, a, in a person's life to be able to bring someone to Christ, a friend of yours who was searching and looking, and then you're able to bring them into the kingdom of God and you'll be able to experience the growth that takes place in them. And I've shared this many times before. But the person that led me to Christ was only a Christian for three months. And he talked to me at the high school. He was on the football team. He was a quarterback. And he came into, I first thought he was going to come and beat me up for something, you know. But all of a sudden he shared with me his life and his testimony. And then he invited me to go to church with him that Sunday. And then after church that Sunday, he gave me a ride home. And in the parking lot of my house, outside in his car, he led me in a sinner's prayer. And then he discipled me. Now, he was only a Christian for three months, but that was more than what I was, <laughs> you know. And we read the word of God together and prayed together. And now he's a pastor out in California in a huge church, and, and I'm out here in the, you know, East Coast <laughs> with the frozen chosen, you know. <laughs> What's wrong with that picture? I don't know. <laughs> no, just kidding. We're planted right where God wants us to be, amen? amen? He makes the difference in our lives. Romans 8, 9 says, And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. If any man does not possess the spirit of Christ, he's not a Christian. I believe that at a time of conversion, everyone receives the Holy Spirit into their lives, whether they realize it or not. Romans 12, 3 talks about there's a measure of faith that takes place. When we receive the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's not how much uh, can the Holy Spirit be released in us, but how much of us will release to the Holy Spirit? And as we give ourselves more over to the Holy Spirit, the more we develop. There's a certain measure of, of, of faith, if you will, in us in a growth that takes place. There's something that takes place that, yes, we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, but as our, we allow ourselves to get deeper and deeper in God, it's like we release more of the Holy Spirit to do things. There's times in our lives we call, we call it, you know, when they came up in Acts and they talked to Paul and he says, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, we believe in Christ, but have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? There was a second work, a second baptism. There was a, a second work that was taking place. But then it doesn't stop there because it says, it says um, that are you filled with the Holy Spirit? And Ephesians talks about, are you being filled with the Holy Spirit? Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the actual translation is just, be being filled. It means that keep being filled. That yesterday's anointing and yesterday's blessing, I want, I want a fresh feeling today of you, God, in my life. And the more we die to self and the more we allow the Holy Spirit to take in, the more that we'll see the Holy Spirit's empowering in our life. You, if you sit there and saying, well, you know, I, you know, I don't know this power. This You're talking foreign language to me. It's why you're so full of self. You haven't died enough to self to allow the Holy Spirit to take more control and more empowering in your life. Verse 10 says, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead. Uh, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. If Christ is in you, then your body, it, it, it still is mortal because we're still deal with flesh in our life, but our spirit is immortal and it becomes a righteousness of our life. The outcome in verse 11 says this, then if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you. Who, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to you and your mortal bottles through his spirit who lives in you. The gift of the Holy Spirit, whom we see at the time of conversion, it's God's promise to us that death isn't the final answer for you, that we'll have everlasting life, and we pass from this life to eternal life. And the thing that God is building in our lives now, what he's doing in your soul and the spirit, 
will be the same soul and spirit that will spend eternity with him. In a sense, the life we live here is a time of, of God being able to nurture us and grow us in the things that we're going to be doing for the rest of eternal, eternity. Why we live on this earth, our mindset has to be of that God continue to do a work in me that I'm what you want me to be when we enter into eternity. He's working in your soul. He's working in your spirit. He's developing a character in you and a personality in you that will last for eternity. Don't turn it off. Realize there's a better work going in you that's more from just today, more for just this week, more to, for just to be able to make you a better person. He's making eternity into your heart and soul. I wanted to go in teaching of the Holy, some more of the Holy Spirit, but my time is up. Um, I'll get to this next week. Some Charles Simpson about that. It's just a really in-depth good, good word that he had. When we understand the Holy Spirit and the work that we, and we're able to give into that, you'll see a growth that'll take place in your life that I believe that you can measure as you look back. Wow, a deepening a furthering, uh, and sometimes it comes to a crisis, and you work through that crisis, and all of a sudden, you've gone to a different level in him. You've allowed the crisis to be a stepping stone, a launching point for you not to be crushed under it, to be launched into a deeper place with God, and that's what's so awesome about the Holy Spirit is that he's alive and active in our lives. Let's stand in the closing word of prayer. Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.